I have an important question for you. When the apocalypse comes, how are you going to use your phone? For most of you, and for myself, I have no answer. But if you happen to work for FEMA, I have a pretty exact answer. You usually hear about FEMA when bad stuff is happening. Hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires. Or you hear about them during your annual rewatch of my video about this one noise they crank out to tell you when something bad is going to happen. FEMA is housed within the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and broadly, the agency is tasked with organizing and coordinating responses to stateside disasters. While often assumed as the doers, they're actually more the ideas guys when disaster strikes, telling the National Guard where they should head, telling the private sector and NGOs where supplies need to go and services need to be set up. All that takes a lot of communication, which can be a problem because in a cyber attack, an act of war, a massive natural disaster, or any of the other stuff FEMA responds to, in the face of things going really bad, communication infrastructure is one of the first things to go down. So when the cell phone towers tumble, or satellites go offline, or landlines get cut, you will no longer be able to call your BFF Jill. But FEMA will be just fine thanks to this system. And it's called the FEMA National Radio System, or FNARS. FNARS is the last line of communication, the ultimate safety net that can keep a response to a disaster coordinated when all else has failed. It's a resiliency that's not reliant on any satellite, nor really any terrestrial resources. It's a high-frequency radio network that requires electricity, a view of the sky, and that's it. You'd think this type of thing would be mind-bendingly complicated. After all, this tech is both reliable and disaster-proof. But it's actually so straightforward and downright humble-looking that I'm not going to show it to you yet because I'm afraid it'll hurt this video's retention. Instead, let's look at this map. This is how the United States will be divided when the water wars of 2063 begin. Just kidding, that'll be Mississippi River Basin v. World. What this actually is is a map of the FNARS Regional Network map. So if there's some kind of catastrophic communications meltdown in, say, Springfield, South Dakota, the state's regional command center would get radio communications going with the regional office in Denver to allow FEMA to coordinate the response. But Sam, you ask me, quaking with fear, what if there's a catastrophic communications meltdown in all the Springfields? If everything goes sideways on a national scale, there's a national FNARS network, too. In that scenario, FNARS would operate out of its national headquarters, which is, you guessed it, a secret nuclear attack-proof bunker in the Shenandoah Mountains. We don't know a whole lot about Mount Weather Emergency Operations Center, but what we do know is that if worse came to worst, the U.S. government would plan to relocate to continue operations here. Or under here, as the heavily classified site was, at least at one point, the nation's largest underground complex equipped with life support systems, underground drinking water reservoirs, broadcast facilities, a cafeteria, and even a fire department. We also know, should a disaster be of national proportion and resilient communications be necessary across the emergency operations centers nationwide, this office would run the show and coordinate across the 10 FEMA regions, plus five federal regional centers. You see, it's all very federalist. Between these two networks, there are 89 total radios across 76 FNARS locations. One, at least, in each state, and one in most territories. While they represent the last line of defense from the cold, dark silence, they don't look like much. Now, while FEMA doesn't exactly publicize its high-frequency radio capabilities, a general FNAR setup would have three main components. First, the radio rack. Or this, the best picture I could find on the internet, while well, still not being a good picture. These require a lot of power, and power amplifiers, and backups, hence the big box. Then there's the antenna. According to one FEMA internet guy, this is the style. The 1942 RTNVIS, which according to this, you throw on the roof, it stands some 20 feet in the air, it can hold up against heavy winds, and has an unspecified erection time. Which is a detail that I just feel like mentioning. The RT stands for rooftop, a handy reminder of where the antenna goes. The NVIS stands for near vertical incident sky wave, and that is important. Rather than using line-of-sight ground waves that can't clear terrain obstacles and can't solve for the curvature of the Earth no matter how flat the landscape, high-frequency skywave antennas shoot radio waves upward at an angle where they then run into the ionosphere, which, because of science, deflects them right back down towards Earth. Using this deflection and simply messing with the angle at which the waves are sent out solves for the mountain ranges and general Earth roundness, giving these radios a range of national proportion. And finally, connecting a radio and antenna to the actual person running the thing, there's the operation center of this system, which looks like this. Basically a late 2000s computer room with some Cold War era looking tech sitting right next to it. That's it. All that separating doomsday communication, darkness, and us is an old computer setup, an antenna with a variable erection time, and a stack of old dusty radio technology in the basement. But given that this is the ultimate fallback technology when it comes to communicating between government officials in the middle of a crisis, it's pretty important that it's pretty damn simple. When all else fails, this system can't. 
So every week, both networks are tested, and every quarter, staff at national and regional offices are trained on how to use the system. For a while we didn't know exactly what the standard operation procedure on these things was until someone put in a Freedom of Information Act request to get all the dirty details on how this works, then posted that online for me to read to myself as a bedtime story. So here's what the FNAR system operator's job actually entails. Capable of connecting via phone patching, radio audio, and text chat, the operator needs to be familiar with running the radio audio panel, which is one of the black boxes next to the monitor, as well as the radio slash telephone interface unit, the other black box, and the computer display that allows interface for chat messaging, as well as controls for the radio linking and antenna orientation. Making operations all that easier is the automatic link establishment feature that these radios possess. Rather than manually surveying all frequencies and channels when scanning, these radios will pick up and link any and all calls and soundings it detects. It's like having your favorite contacts saved, or your favorite TV channels memorized so you don't have to go one by one trying to find Pawn Stars. For the national network then, any radio across the network will be monitoring and immediately pick up on any calls from any of the other radios. As for the messages themselves, well, they say a lot before they really say anything. Here's the handy sheet on how you're supposed to send a message. It's kind of like an address meets taxes. You need the time, the destination, the network, the time received. All in all, you need 18 boxes worth of information before you actually get to the message. It's not the most efficient means of yap, but you can't deny that it's at least detailed. So should that day come when your power is out, your cell service is cooked, and you're waiting for help, just know that even if all other communication has gone dark, there's someone out there testing their quarterly training, refreshing their memory with the guide, and working their way through these cheat sheets to get their message out to the rest of the disaster response infrastructure. Now, if you're someone who watched this video and thought, wow, I wish Sam didn't work so hard to avoid actually explaining the physics behind high-frequency radio waves, then boy do I have a service for you. It's called Brilliant, it's the sponsor of today's video, and it's an online learning platform that will have you grasping the physics behind radio waves and the trigonometry behind sky waves in no time. Whether it's in math, programming, data, or science, Brilliant's lessons meet you where you are in terms of knowledge base and time commitment. With fast, fun, bite-sized nodules, learning on Brilliant feels less like a hassle and more like a reward stashed somewhere in your busy day. If you're curious, simply interested in honing your own problem solving, or just want to replace less productive screen habits with one that feeds your brain, I recommend giving Brilliant a try. And you can do as much for free by heading to brilliant.org slash HI, where you'll also get 20% off a premium subscription for those of you who want unlimited access to everything on Brilliant.